Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is part 41 of Tafsir al-Sadi. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Yis'alunaka anil ahilla. Qul hiya mawaqeetu lin-nasi wal-hajj. Wa laysa al-birru bi an ta'tu al-buyuta min zuhuriha. Wa lakinna al-birra man ittaqa. Wa atu al-buyuta min abwaabiha. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ They ask you about the phases of the moon. Say, they are a means of determining time for the organization of human affairs and for Hajj. It is not righteous to enter your houses from the rear. Rather, righteousness is to fear Allah. So enter houses through their doors and fear Allah so that you may prosper. They ask you about the phases of the moon. What is the wisdom behind them? Or they ask about the moon phases themselves. Say they are a means of determining time for the organization of human affairs. By His grace and mercy, Allah Azza wa Jal has caused them to change in this manner. The moon appears weak at the beginning of the month, then it gradually increases until halfway through the month, then it begins to decrease until the end of the month. This is so that people will know thereby times for their acts of worship, such as fasting, as well as the times of paying zakah and offering expiation and the time of Hajj. Because Hajj takes place during certain well-known months and takes a long time, Allah says, and for Hajj. From the phases of the moon, people also know the times for paying off deferred debts, rental periods, the length of the idda and pregnancy, and other matters that have to do with people's affairs. Allah has made it a means of working out times that is available to everyone, young and old, knowledgeable and ignorant. If times were calculated according to the solar calendar, no one would know it except very few people. It is not righteousness to enter your houses from the rear. In the past, when the Ansar and others among the Arabs entered Ihram, they would not enter houses through their doors, thinking that this action was a kind of worship and righteousness. So Allah told them that it was not righteousness because Allah Azza wa Jal had not prescribed it for them. Any person who does an act of worship that was not prescribed by Allah or His Messenger وسلم, is worshipping on the basis of innovation, bid'ah. He commanded them to enter houses through their doors because that is easier for them and one of the aims of Sharia is to make things easier for people. From this verse we learn that in every situation one should approach the matter in the easiest manner that Allah has made the means of doing it. So the one who wants to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil should look at the character of a person and his situation and use gentleness and tact by means of which his intended goal will be met completely or partially. Both student and teacher should follow the easiest way of reaching the educational goal. The same applies to everyone who tries to do something. If he, approach it, if he approaches it in the proper manner, if he approaches it in the proper manner and persists in it, he will inevitably reach his goal with the help of Allah Azza wa Jal. and fear Allah. This is the righteousness that Allah enjoys, that is adhering to piety at all times, obeying his commands and heeding his prohibitions. This is the means of success, which is attaining one's goal and saving oneself from what one is afraid of. The one who 
does not fear Allah Azza wa Jal would have no way of attaining success, whereas the one who does fear him will attain success. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Fight in the cause of Allah those who fight you, but do not overstep the limits. For Allah does not love those who overstep the limits. وَقُتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ تَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ وَأَخْرِجُوهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَخْرَجُوكُمْ وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ وَلَا تُقَاتِلُوهُمْ عِنْدَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ حَتَّى يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِيهِ فَإِنْ قَاتَلُوكُمْ فَقَتُلُوهُمْ كَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ And slay them wherever you find them and drive them out from where they have driven you out. For persecution is worse than slaughter. But do not fight them in the sacred mosque unless they first fight you there. But if they fight you then, fight them. But if they fight you then, slay them. Such is the recompense, such is the recompense of the disbelievers. But if they desist, then Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ فَإِنْ يَنْتَهَوْ فَلَا عُدْوَانَ إِلَّا عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ Fight them until there is no more worshipping of others along with Allah. And all worship becomes devoted to Allah alone. But if they desist, let them, let there be no more hostility except towards wrongdoers. These verses include the command to fight for the sake of Allah. This came after the migration to Medina when the Muslims had become strong enough to fight. Allah instructed them to fight after they had been instructed to refrain. The stipulation that fighting should only be in the cause of Allah is encouragement to make it sincerely for Him alone. This also implies prohibition on getting involved in fighting during turmoil in which Muslims kill other Muslims. الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ Those who fight you. That is, those who are prepared to fight you. This refers to adult men, not old men, who have no contribution to making, who have no contribution to make, to fighting, whether by offering opinions or joining the physical fight. The prohibition on overstepping the limits applies to all such acts, such as killing non-combatants like women, the insane, children, monks, and the like, mutilating the bodies of the slain, or killing animals and cutting down trees, and other acts that bring no benefit to the Muslims. Another kind of overstepping. Another kind of overstepping the limits is fighting those from whom jizya may be accepted if they agree to give it. That is not permissible. And slay them wherever you find them. This is a command to fight them wherever they are found at all times, whether defending or attacking. Then an exception is made to this general command to fight them. But do not fight them in the sacred mosque. That is not permissible unless they are the ones who initiate the fighting there, in which case they are to be fought in requital for their aggression. This is ongoing at all times until they give up their disbelief and become Muslim. Then Allah will accept their repentance no matter what they did in the past of disbelieving in Allah and worshipping others alongside Him in the sacred mosque and preventing the messengers and the believers from reaching it. This is out of His mercy and kindness towards His slaves. Because fighting in the sacred mosque may make people think that this is mischief in this holy city, Allah tells us that the mischief in that place caused by associating others with Allah and persecuting the Muslims is worse than the mischief of slaughter. So there is no sin on you Muslims for fighting them.
From this verse is derived the well-known principle of committing the lesser of two evils in order to ward off the greater. Then Allah Azza wa tells us of the purpose behind fighting for his cause. The aim is not to shed the blood of the disbelievers and take their wealth. Rather, the aim is so that all worship becomes devoted to Allah alone, in order that the religion of Allah Azza wa may prevail over all other religions and to ward off everything that is opposed to it, such as polytheism and so on. If this aim is achieved, then there is no, then there is to be no killing or fighting. But if they desist and stop fighting you in the sacred mosque, let there be no more hostility except towards wrongdoers. That is, there should be no aggression on your part towards them, except in the case of wrongdoers among them, who deserve punishment according to their wrongdoing. فَمَنْ يَعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَاعْتَدُوا عَلَيْهِ بِمِثْلِ مَا اَعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ A sacred month for a sacred month. Violation of any sanctity calls for fair retribution. So, if anyone transgresses against you, then attack him as he attacked you. But fear Allah and know that Allah is with those who fear him. The words a sacred month for a sacred month may be interpreted as referring to what the polytheists did of preventing the Prophet ﷺ and his companions from entering Mecca in the year of Al Hudaybiyah and agreeing that they could enter it and make up the missed Umrah the following year. Both incidents preventing the Muslim from entering Mecca and their making up the missed Umrah occurred in a sacred month, namely Dhul Qadah. So the one made up for the other. This is offered, this offered consolation to the companions by allowing them to complete their rituals of Umrah. It may also mean if you fight them in the sacred month, but they are the ones who started the fight and were the aggressors, then you are not to be blamed for, you are not to be blamed for fighting back. According to this understanding, the words violation of any sanctity calls for fair retribution come under the heading of stating a general principle after a specific one. In other words, with regard to everything that is to be venerated, whether it is a sacred month, a sacred land, being in a state of ihram, or, or anything more general than that, everything that Sharia enjoins us to venerate, if anyone transgresses against it, then there should be retribution against him. The one who fights during the sacred month is to be fought. The one who violates the sacred city should be subjected to the had punishment and has no protection in the sacred place. The one who kills his peer is to be killed in return. The one who wounds another or severs his limb is to be subjected to legal, to legal retribution. The one who takes the wealth of another unlawfully should have an equivalent amount taken from him. But can the one who is the right take as much as he is entitled to or not? But can the one who is in the right take as much as he is entitled to or not? There is a difference of scholarly opinion concerning this matter. The correct view is that if the reason for him having this right is obvious, such as a guest who is not offered hospitality or when a man refuses to spend on a wife or relative on whom one is obliged to spend. In such cases, it is permissible to take one's right from that person's wealth. But if the reason is not obvious, such as one who denied the debt that he owed to another or betrayed the trust that he was given or he stole something and so on, in such cases, it is not permissible for him to take compensation from the wrongdoer's wealth so as to reconcile between the evidence. Hence, Allah Azza wa Jal says, emphasizing the above, so if anyone transgresses against you, then attack him as he attacked you. This explains how to settle scores, namely, like for like. Because 
In most cases, people would not stop at the limits when granted a concession allowing retaliation. Since people want that satisfaction, Allah Azza wa Jal enjoined them to always fear Him, which means heeding His limits and not overstepping them. Allah tells us that He is with those who fear Him, and He will help them, support them, and guide them. If Allah is with a person, He will attain eternal happiness. But if a person does not adhere to piety and fear of Allah, he will forsake him and not protect him. He will leave him to his own devices and thus his doom will be closer to him than his juggler vein. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. وَأَنْفِقُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَةِ وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And spend in the cause of Allah and do not contribute to your destruction with your own hands. But do good, for Allah loves those who do good. Here Allah Azza wa Jal commands His slaves to spend for His sake, which means giving wealth in ways that bring one closer to Allah. These are all good ways, such as giving charity to one who is needy, or to a relative, or spending on dependents on whom one is obliged to spend. More important, the first and foremost is spending on jihad for the sake of Allah. Spending on it is itself jihad with one's wealth. It is obligatory just as physical jihad is, and it serves great purposes such as helping to, strength, to strengthen the Muslims and it serves great purposes such as helping to strengthen the Muslims and weaken polytheism and its followers and helping to establish and support the religion of Allah. Jihad for the sake of Allah cannot be done except by spending. Spending for jihad is like the soul for the body. It cannot exist without it. Failing to spend for the sake of Allah undermines jihad and gives and gives power and strength to the enemy. So the word so the words and do not contribute to your destruction with your own hands serve as a reason why one should spend on jihad. Contributing to your own destruction with your own hands refers to two things. Not doing what is enjoined, which inevitably leads to ruin in both physical and spiritual terms, and doing that which leads to self-destruction, which includes many things such as not engaging in jihad for the sake of Allah or spending on it, which inevitably leads to the enemy gaining power over the Muslims, taking unnecessary risks when fighting or traveling in dangerous places where there are wild animals or snakes, climbing trees or dangerous structures, walking underneath some, something that poses a danger and so on. Such things will come under the heading of contributing to your destruction with your own hands. Other kinds of contributing to your destruction with your own hands include persisting in disobedience and sin, despairing of ever repenting, failing to do obligatory duties that Allah has enjoined, failure to do which leads to ruin in spiritual, failure to do which leads to ruin in spiritual and physical terms. Because spending for the sake of Allah is a kind of good deed, Allah enjoins doing good deed. Allah enjoins doing good in general terms. But do good for Allah loves those who do good. That includes all kinds of doing good because it is not limited to any particular thing. That also includes doing good with one's wealth as stated above. It also includes being kind to people by using one's position to help, interceding and so on, enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil, teaching beneficial knowledge, meeting people's needs by relieving their distress, helping at times of hardship, visiting the sick, attending their funerals, guiding those who have gone astray, helping people with their work, doing things for those who cannot do them themselves, and other things that come under the heading of kindness as enjoined by Allah. Kindness also includes worshipping Allah Azza wa properly 
which is, as the Prophet وسلم, said, you should worship Allah as if you can see him. And if you cannot see him, he sees you. Whoever has the characteristics, whoever has these characteristics is one of those of whom Allah says, for those who do good, there will be the best reward and more besides. Quran chapter 10, verse 26, Surah Yunus. Allah will be with such a one, guiding him and helping him in all his affairs. Having mentioned the rulings on fasting and jihad, Allah now speaks of the rulings on Hajj. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.